So I'm Emma Hodinot, I'm the local government officer at the Co-op Party and hopefully you're here for a Zoom on Hopeful Towns um, with um, Hope Not Hate. Um, just a few housekeeping things for you at the moment and um, we'll keep everybody on mute apart from the speakers just so there's no background noise. Uh, appreciating children have gone to school but there may still be dogs and doorbells going off um, while we're stuck at home. Um, we, we're due to run um, for about an hour and this session is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to um, be, part, be seen as part of that recording, then please um, turn your video off. Um, the video will be available afterwards on YouTube. So um, if you enjoyed it, tell people about it, they'll be able to watch it later. Um, and I think that is pretty much all the housekeeping. So um, I will introduce our great um, panel of speakers that we've got today. So um, first off, we're going to hear from Chris Clark. Now, Chris is the policy officer at Hope Not Hate. And um, then we've got uh, Councillor Emily, Emily Darlington. Um, she's cabinet member for Public Realm at Milton Keynes. Um, and then we've also got um, Tina Boatas, who is our Labour and Co-op candidate for Letchworth um, North as well. Uh, and they'll be sharing their perspective of, of what we're talking about today. Um, but first off, we're going to hear from Chris. Um, he's going to talk to us about the, the Hope Not Hate um, Hopeful Towns project, um, which is aiming to help towns across England and Wales. And I'm sure he's going to tell you all about it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Chris, um, so you can share your screen and share the research that Hope Not Hate have been doing. Great. Thank you very, very much, um, Emma, and thanks for having uh, having us. And I'm just going to try and share the screen. Sorry. Can everybody see the, the, my screen now? Just to check. That's that, that's worked, uh, yeah, hasn't it? I the screen share. Right. Yeah, <laughs> if you just want to cool. put it on slideshow mode, that'll be great. That's it. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, for having us. Um, I really appreciate it. And I was going to basically talk through a report we did. Um, in it was actually in sort of the September of last year that we released this report. Um, but it's a part of a kind of wider project called Hopeful Towns, which we're um, which we're running. Uh, the 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 sort of um, sorry the sort of origins of this is that uh, obviously Hope Not Hate's work, um, for those who don't know, is focused around um, tackling the far right, tackling um, sort of anti-immigration, anti-multiculturalism narratives and uh, is formed on the basis that um, if communities are given a choice between hope and uh, hope and hate, um, uh, they, choose, uh, they, they choose hope. Um, what we do within the policy team is our focus is more on some of the deeper underlying causal factors which can cause certain areas to be more vulnerable to far right narratives taking hold. Um, and there was a report that um, I Hope Not Hate released in 2018 for I was working for the organisation called um, Fear, Hope and Loss, which found very strong correlations between deprivation and hostility to uh, hostility to migration and multiculturalism. Um, so it was, uh, and it in particular found that in town communities, i.e. in smaller places, that was more pronounced. Um, the aim of this report uh, was the, which we produced last year, was to kind of build on that um, and to look in more detail at what were the precise sort of different circumstances that could, that meant that certain places were more vulnerable than other places to um, to kind of people coming in reaching sort of hateful um, or far right narratives. Um, so it was primarily a data project, uh, uh, and it was it was based. We worked with the Centre for Towns, which is a small academic think tank, on developing it, and it was based on their list of 862 towns. Their definition of 862 towns. 
um, across England and Wales. We, uh, we basically included every places with a population between 10,000 and 250,000, including within that smaller cities, so cities with a population under 250,000. Um, but the aim was really, particularly when the report was being written, there was a lot of discussion of towns um, and a lot of discussion of town policies, but it was really a very broad term towns we incorporated a huge range of places within it. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do within the report was look at, co we were looking at cohesion, but we were also looking at resilience. So we wanted to look at areas that didn't have a, you know, big non-white British populations, but still might be susceptible to some of these narratives. So really how resilient certain areas were to, um, to change, how resilient if there was a very abrupt demographic change or a particular flashpoint, um, how resilient they were to, to prevent that escalating into something more kind of um, uglier. Um, just giving a little bit of background here. This is based on research from uh, the Fear, Hope and Loss report in 2018 that I, that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, but what that report did was it looked at uh, LSOA areas, which are areas of around, um, I think it's 1500 residents, uh, and looked at the kind of attitudes using very, very, you know, polling aggregated to the very local level to look at attitudes in different areas. So what it found was that in different parts of the population, there were quite different attitudes. So as you can see in those little thumbnail maps, the, um, the, red, the, the red map shows confident multiculturalism, which is the most positive, most liberal attitude towards migration. Um, and we can see it's much more concentrated in, um, in areas around London and the Southeast. Uh, whereas active enmity, which is the most negative, shown by the black dots, is much more prominent in other parts of the country. Um, the, and and, and the, the, the chart underneath shows uh, all of the towns that we looked at by size. So it shows that there's a really big difference between places like, you know, our biggest town, which was Northampton, right down to our the smallest towns within the report. So we wanted to really get under the skin of this issue. One of the first things we identified was that there was a particular town's challenge, if you like, you set aside deprivation, which was clearly a really big factor here, more de deprived places are much less liberal about, um, about migration and multiculturalism. We still found that towns were, even when you kind of allowed for deprivation, were less liberal than similarly deprived cities. So the blue dots there on that map show core cities, basically the higher up the dot, the more liberal they are about migration, um, and the lower the dots, the, the, more, uh, the more hostile. So we can see that, that kind of core cities like Liverpool, which are very deprived, were still more, more um, liberal than places with similar, uh, than places that were smaller towns with similar deprivation, if that makes sense. Um, so our kind of hypothesis was that there are a range of different factors in each place. So this shows, this, the, the map to the right shows, for example, um, LSOAs, which were above average for hostility to immigration, um, but were not deprived. So the black dots show places which are not deprived, but were nevertheless hostile to immigration. And the pink dots in that map show areas which were um, uh, were deprived in the top three deciles for deprivation, but was, were nevertheless liberal. So you can see these different elements in different parts of the country that it isn't just deprivation, it isn't just demographics, there's other factors at play as well. So overall, we did a lot of data analysis of the sort I've just showed, um, and we came up with 14 factors, which we believed would sort of, um, lower resilience and potentially amplify hostility to migration and to multiculturalism. Um, these are listed in this diagram below and uh, they, they basically incorporate the first, I'll, I'll just list them, the first one is traditional demographics which is areas which have certain set of demographics, places which are white, places which are lower levels of graduates, places which are older. The second is visible decline which I'm going to come back to uh, shortly. The third is shrinking and aging places. So very much as it sounds, places where population is getting older and getting smaller, um, tended to be more hostile to migration. The fourth is in 
in places where there was industrial short uncertain industrial futures so places at risk of automation and things like that the fifth was cross-cutting deprivation so places with very extreme poverty the sixth was competition for resources so areas where there was pressure on services pressure on jobs uh, and particularly if there was a, a a large new migrant population that could be sort of the thing that could be pointed out by, by far-right groups um the the next one was um rapid change so areas with very rapid economic and demographic change were more vulnerable um the next one was migration in the community so places with particular forms of migration in the community um uh sometimes could be more vulnerable to far-right narratives uh the um so i'm losing count now but the next one was authoritarian footprint areas so places with a history of far right activity were in our view more vulnerable to that kind of rearing its head again in the future um the next one was strong national identity so places with a very strong english um, or national identity uh, or welsh national identity were more likely to be hostile to migration um, the next one was fewer cultural opportunities which was places where there was less art opportunities uh, the next one was fewer heritage assets which we'll come back to the next one was um, places with, with coastal challenges which was very specific issues in coastal communities and the final factor was less con less connected areas so places which are hard to get to and were kind of cut off by infrastructure were more likely to be hostile to migration the reason for doing this was to to try and look in isolation at the different things which might mean one place is more vulnerable than another to these kind of things um, and uh what we then looked at was so that the chart below shows on the, the vertical axis um migration liberalism so how liberal an area was uh, and on the horizontal axis the number of clusters an area fell into so we basically looked at every town in the uk many 14 characteristics they um they had and then we have listed that so we can see that areas with more clusters tended to be less liberal um and it, again the next chart shows that places which fell into these clusters places which had visible decline for example were much more likely to under index for liberalism um than to over index so this is the sort of rationale behind what we did and then what we did 862 towns um and we uh we kind of clustered them so we looked at um how many uh we, we got basically a kind of index of which which factors they were subject to and the, the darker yellow sort of squares are show that places were particularly were, were you know fully fulfilled all the criteria so we can see that Aberdare had all four characteristics of cross-cutting deprivation whereas the paler yellow shows that it kind of fulfilled most of the characteristics to fall into that cluster um, so this was the, the background to the research and the view obviously every place is different and it was there, there might you know there may be anomalies in the data or things we've we've missed but the idea was to try and take a kind of um, uh, a stand back and have a look at what the different issues were in different places I'm just I'm now going to talk about two of those specific clusters because Emma mentioned that your focus was very much uh, for this year was on um, on high streets and we wanted to look at two areas visible decline and heritage assets which feed into that so the first because th these two things are sort of loosely related to the high streets question um the first factor is visible decline the, 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 the first of these is visible decline and there were 67 towns which fulfilled all four traits of this so these are places with above average crime deprivation above average living environment deprivation um above average social issues like drug deaths um and uh above average pub closures so these are issues which at a very immediate local level could potentially we you know inflame feelings of loss and make make areas more hostile to change and we've mapped there where the different areas with these factors um fell and that is quite interesting that it's mostly areas in in yorkshire and lancashire actually or not mostly but a, a particular concentration of towns with these 
fit this this um, context in those areas. Um, just to give a, a sort of sense of some of the reasons behind this, so this chart shows living environment deprivation. Um, the further to the right a town is, the more living environment deprivation there is, and the higher up on the vertical axis, the more liberal it is about immigration and, and multiculturalism and race. Uh, and we can see that there's a kind of correlation, there are outliers obviously, but places which have higher living environment deprivation are generally less liberal, as the, uh, the red line indicates. Similarly, when we look at um, drug deaths from poisoning, uh, which is um, something which is much more common in, uh, particularly in seaside towns, we can see Blackpool there, but once again, places with above average levels of drug deaths from poisoning, more likely to have migration ch challenges, to be less kind of liberal about, about change and difference. Um, and again, when we looked at pub closures, this shows the change in the number of pubs on the, the horizontal axis between 2001 and 2018, i.e. for the past nearly two decades. Most places have seen significant numbers of pub closures, but we can see, again, there's a correlation that the places that have seen the most pub closures, places like Wednesbury, which is down there in the bottom left corner, um, are more likely to be hostile to migration and multiculturalism. So these factors, they don't directly feed into, into high streets in all cases, but they show that when there is visible decline at the local level, it amplifies, um, you know, the far right threat and the risks to resilience and the, the risks of tensions. Um, sorry, I've nearly, nearly finished on this. I know I don't want to go over my time, but um, the second factor, which we thought really related to this high streets question was about um, you know, her heritage assets. Uh, this was a cluster which looked at um, it looked at places which had less of the things which society conventionally uses to kind of confer status or prestige on a place. So places without universities, places without um, football clubs, places without things like a medieval history uh, or a, a city status or a, a county town status, um, or things like even things like military bases were a factor here. And what this is based on the fact that our research found that generally speaking, if places had some of these kind of assets, these hooks that they could hang their identity on, it made them much more confident in um, sort of holding off far right narratives, if you like. Um, so if you look at uh, this chart shows, the top, it shows all towns, it shows that all towns on average, the average is I think minus 0.33 for liberalism. So the average is uh, that top bar. It shows that places with city status or county town status um, are above average liberalism. Uh, and the places, if you go down towards the bottom, places that have none of the above things, no market town status, no university, no barracks, no football club, um, are more hostile to migration than average. Uh, an interesting fact though is football clubs, which it shows appears that football clubs actually make areas more um, more, host more hostile to migration. But if you look at, um, if you factor in deprivation for that, this, this chart shows towns with low deprivation, towns with medium deprivation and towns with high deprivation. And you can see that deprivation remains a really big factor. Um, but if an area has, is very deprived and has a football club, it's less hostile, less, more liberal than an area that doesn't. Um, so that that kind of asset, that core, so, core that source of confidence and pride, is, is really important factor in our view. Um, again, this this chart, very much like the other one, it shows migration liberalism on that vertical axis. Uh, it's a really pronounced chart, but it shows average house prices in an area compared to the regional average. So not just house prices on average, but how how house prices, let's say, in the southeast. The house prices of the town compared with the house prices in the, the southeast region and this was actually much more pronounced as a correlation than house prices overall and what it showed was that if an area was a kind of a cheaper more affordable place compared to other other the surrounding areas um i.e it had less of a kind of center of gravity of people wanting to move there or live there it was a lot 
less um, lot less liberal than places which were above average house prices compared to their local area. Um, again, we've done this is the final slide, sorry, but we've done um, we've looked at uh, places with sorry the bottom's been chopped off here, but it's supposed to show places with um, below average deprivation for liberalism and above average deprivation for liberalism, and the the, the blue columns show places with city status, county town status, or market town status, i.e. areas that have conventionally been a hub where people come to do their shopping or to, to meet. Um, and the green bars show areas without any of those three things. Um, and again, it shows that places with um, without any of those things, even if they're deprived, are more likely. So places which have those sorts of forms of status, even if they're deprived, are less likely to be hostile to, to change and difference than places which don't have those status. Um, so that's the, um, the kind of presentation. Sorry if I've overgone my time, I'm just whizzing through a little bit. But um, the next steps off the basis of this, this report is very much a kind of looking at things through the other end of the telescope, if you like, trying to, to understand these issues from a, a broad, quantitative um, perspective. Uh, off the back of it, we've aimed to identify some key next steps, which for us is uh, identifying joined up approaches between places, focusing on towns as the primary unit, ideas about targeted national policies, developing, finding ways to develop and share best practice at the local level, uh, and really emphasizing that when it comes to communications, every town should count, really trying to push back against some of those, you know, crap towns or worse towns sort of narratives. Um, and as part of this, we've developed what's called the Hopeful Towns program, um, where it's still very much in the early days. And because of obviously the limitations of COVID, um, it's been very hard to do some of the elements of it. But we've started to develop a towns leadership network, which includes things like regular data blogs and data updates of the kind I've been showing today, a news newsletter with information. Uh, and we're also doing a What Works webinar series, which is looking at each of these different sort of 14 challenges or some of the challenges of kind of group together, we're looking at them in isolation and trying to hear really good examples of things that have worked. So just to do a little plug to finish off, uh, our next event is on March the 18th, the next Thursday, looking at the public realm and the role of public realm in, in tackling the far right and tackling decline narratives, if anyone's interested in um, coming along to that. Um, the uh, And yeah, you can sign up for the Towns Leadership Network using that URL at the bottom of my presentation there. So thank you very much everyone for having me and I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and uh, thanks thanks again. If I can unmute. Thank you very much Chris. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. I've read the report but actually seeing it on screen and talking us through it um, really does bring it to life. And as you say, at the court party this year, we're looking at the issue of high streets. Um, we talk about high streets, but a lot of those issues around it and uh, around the, the challenges that towns are facing in particular all come into that conversation. So I'm really interested. I've put the link into the chat if any members want to take that discussion forward into your own branches and, and regions. And I think um, that kind of information from Hope Not Hate really helps us um, with that. Um, so um, we've got um, two people from towns that are mentioned in that report, um, and I'm going to invite them to sort of share their, their thoughts, um, but also their experiences of their area as well. And then if we've got time, we'll obviously open it up to questions. Um, if you have questions, um, you can raise your hand or you can use the chat function to submit them as well. Either of those um, we're happy with. Um, but without further ado, I will ask um, Councillor Emily, Emily Darlington um, to come in from um, Milton Keynes. But you're also, I believe, the Cabinet Member for Public Realm as well. So I'm sure you've got some really interesting views on this. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. So I'm the Cabinet Member for the Public Realm, um, Council Housing, uh, High Streets and Economic Recovery. Um, and parishes and there's there's several other things in my brief but so this is really really relevant actually and thank you so much Chris for for your presentation um, 
So it's interesting, you know, Milton Keynes, you'll all know it, you probably know it for its roundabouts, but you'll know it's a new town. And when it was first formed, there was a lot of thought to put into community cohesion. So you used to get uh, uh, somebody who would welcome you to the town and they'd knock on your door and there'd be a welcome pack and it was your part of this community um, and also designed into Milton Keynes as a principle was mixed communities. Now, this is not necessarily carried through, um, but I think has left us a bit of a legacy because while we do have some very big new uh, immigrant populations. We have a very big Somali population. I think we're second, uh, second only to Cardiff outside London for, uh, for, the, um, for our Somali population. Um, we also have significant Bangladeshi community. Um, you know, it, um, there are significant uh, multicultural communities, but we also have a really big program around culture. Um, and if any of you, and I'll do a little plug here, we have an international festival every second year, which is a big art festival across the city. Please, please come. People from around the world come. Um, and it's, it's absolutely amazing because what we're trying to pick up, and I'm sure the founders kind of thought of this, and the same, some of the Chris is talking about, because if you don't have that art and heritage and identity of place, this is where that you know you can you find that things can get embedded now as i said during austerity we've lost a lot of these things and what we have seen is some of the attitudes and certainly brexit was one of those tinderbox moments in all of our communities wasn't it to see some of this happening um not least in my own ward i'm, I'm one of the bletchley ward councillors long rich history also very large italian community that settled there after the war and were part of the brickworks and building Milton Keynes. And all of a sudden they were faced with a level of racism they'd never seen before. Um, and, and in some ways, I think we got a bit complacent in Milton Keynes. So I wanted to talk about some of the more hopeful things that we're kind of trying to do. So in Bletchley specifically, um, it's part of the Towns Fund, Bletchley and Fenny Stratford, so two of our oldest towns. Um, and very much at the heart of that, we're thinking about how you rethink the high street, not to be a competition to Amazon, but actually to be that cultural experience, that identity of Bletchley, to make it attractive as the center point between the arc, between Oxford and Cambridge arc, but also to celebrate its own history. So we're doing a lot about celebrating Bletchley's history and the role that it's played on the national stage and, and, the, you know, and the pride that we have with that. But we're also trying to do quite a bit about bringing in those communities that helped to build Milton Keynes. So while it's a recent history, it is part of our identity. So whether it's a community that, that came out of London or a community that, that came from Somalia or a community that came from Italy and chose to settle in Milton Keynes, they are part of that history of building us as a city and building that identity. Now that's not always easy, um, and we see it in some of our region areas, uh, you know, you see some of those conflicts come about, you know, and who's getting council housing and it's always these kinds of people that are getting council housing and you see those flashpoints around, you know, the deprivation because Milton Keynes, as much as we have beautiful green spaces and more green space per head than anywhere else and all of this kind of stuff, it hides some real levels of deprivation. We've got some of the, you know, it, comparatively uh, we've got really some of the the highest levels of deprivation and you wouldn't necessarily expect it in our town. Um, I guess there's a lot of hope that's coming out of it actually there's a lot of work that we're doing to build that a lot of our cultural institutions that have been left over from the development corporation we're trying to embed within that so whether it's the international festivals or whether it's the you know MK arts uh, or whatever it might be uh, MK Community Foundation that we are absolutely trying to embed that again and celebrate it. The final point I'll make, and because it's the week of International Women's Week, uh, uh, International Women's Day, is the role of women in this. The role of women is absolutely crucial in integration um, and community and and acceptance, right and too often still that in some communities, women are still behind those doors. 
And so we do a lot of work, and I certainly do a lot of work as a ward councillor, but also as a cabinet member, ensuring that those voices come out um, into, into forums and are heard in, in, in forums because there's so much commonality. And this is, this is again, this is not to say against the men in the room, but anybody who's mum knows it doesn't matter where you are from around the world, those common experiences of being a mum are sometimes more powerful than any other kind of national identity or anything else that comes along, right? And that can really break down barriers in a way that, that can be more problematic in the more formal structures that we have, uh, you know, in society. Um, and so I would just point to the fact that, that women, whether it's leading regeneration projects, which seems to be, <laughs> most of our regen projects are led by women. Um, and I think that's incredible because actually I think it gets to an understanding about the role of community, the role of togetherness. Um, uh, because we have those common experiences as women, no matter our backgrounds. So thank you very much, Chris. Um, and this has been really stimulating for me and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more that we can all take back into our, into our towns and cities. No, thank you very much for that. And that was really interesting. And I certainly learned a lot more about Milton Keynes that I didn't know about. So um, thank you very much um, for that. Um, we were due to be joined uh, by Rob James, who um, from Carmarthenshire, who um, again one of the the areas that is mentioned. I don't know if he's managed to to get into the to the room. I just wanted to check before we moved on to our next speaker. No, I don't think so. So um, apologies um, from uh, Rob um, for that. Um, I don't think. Um, he's been able to join us. So um, I'll move on to our third um, speaker, um, which is um, Tina, Tina Bartwas, who is uh, in Letchworth, who I was mentioned on one of those slides, actually, is the, the largest small town <laughs> in the report. Um, and uh, Tina is our, our youth rep down in the southeast, but also uh, is standing in Letchworth, and she's going to share some of her perspectives um, I guess on, on these issues and how it's seen down in Letchworth. So over, over to you, Tina. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to have been asked to take part in this panel um, with wonderful colleagues. And I want to say a massive thank you to Hope Not Hate for this um, report. I've spent a lot of time going over it. So anyone who knows me knows that I talk about towns a lot. Um, and so 33 million people in England and Wales call towns um, their home. And I'm very proud to be from one of these towns and my background there. Um, I want to start off with talking about the report because I think that it was really interesting um, to me, the, the link between deprivation and hostile attitudes because in Letchworth, um, 1,335 of our residents um, fit into that 20% most deprived in England category. Um, and there's also the matter that is in the east of England, um, towns fall disproportionately into the competition for resources thing. So there's a lot of pressure on services and jobs and resulting tension from that. And I think, I think the report highlights Clacton and Basildon in our region um, as being particularly vulnerable to that. I think, I think heritage is a really interesting topic because in my county of Hertfordshire, we have all sorts of towns. We have the world's first garden city, we have historic market towns, we have new towns, and all of those places have their own distinct identities. Um, so in terms of the visible decline of towns, um, I'd be really interested to know what what's the first thing that comes to everyone else's mind. But when I was thinking about this, it was high streets and town centres for me, um, which we've already mentioned that high streets is a big part of what the co-op party is doing this year. And I think it's important because certainly in Letchworth, we've seen 
an increase in empty units. Um, the types of shops have changed quite substantially. Um, what I will say is it's been really good to see that some independent businesses have done well over this period. Um, and we've also seen more employee owned businesses over this time, including our local book store. So that's really positive, but it's been a challenging time for people and we've had to really change the way in which we're working. Um, I think that there's a lot of room for cooperation where supporting local businesses and enterprise is concerned. Um, and that's kind of before you get onto a whole host of other issues that we've got um, from a lack of public services and in my division in particular, roads and flooding. Um, something else I want to raise is planning and infrastructure because I think that quite a lot of the time infrastructure and planning applications are coming from places and kind of that it, it's a top-down approach, it's not a grassroots one. And I think that that's really harmful to communities. Um, it's absolutely essential that local views are listened to and that we have appropriate consultation with local stakeholders for things like this. Um, and a lot of the time that doesn't just mean challenging um, conservative administrations, but actually the government as well. And I think the co-op party is a really useful tool for this because I think we're unique in the way that we reimagine um, regeneration and in terms of our community focus as well. So what can we do as labour and co-op? Um, I think looking forward, we've got, we've obviously got the COVID-19 recovery and something I spotted in the report as well was the so the top 40 towns for COVID death rate per 10,000 residents and from March 1st to April 17th, three of these towns were in my county in Hertfordshire, um, Bishy, Potters Bar and Boreham Wood. Um, I thought that was quite concerning, but we're not also looking at the pandemic in isolation. We're looking at the context of a decade of austerity and the impact that's had on local government. Um, so in North Hearts, our district council, we're very proud to run it in a joint administration. So it's the Labour and Cooperative Group alongside the Liberal Democrats, and it's given us the opportunity to do so many things. Um, so our group has fought to support our leisure services during the lockdown, and I think that's important in terms of retaining those jobs and those community spaces. Um, we have cabinet panels on the environment, cooperative development and community engagement. And those are all things that have been a focus of this administration. Um, and having that cooperative development portfolio, I think in of itself, it's, it's giving something really different that's part of who we are as cooperators. And it it kind of sets us apart from other people, as well as that we've had a real focus on supporting local businesses by shopping local and that sort of community wealth building. I think like we, we say it again and again in the co-op party, it couldn't be more important. Um, and what I'm looking at um, as I'm standing for the county council is working together and I'm very proud to be standing on a platform um, which is fighting for the most vulnerable. We're fighting against poverty, against cuts, and for a socially just county. Um, at the heart of this is our support for residents and businesses. Um, and to do that, we need to be building a strong local economy. We need to protect good jobs, and we can do this in conjunction with our trade union colleagues um, and it's something that you know it's a massive asset to our party um, so a huge passion of mine is tackling the climate crisis and I think this comes in in quite a significant way when you're looking at um, both the kind of visible decline of towns and how do we recover from COVID and austerity because 
I think there's a real opportunity to pave the way for good green jobs. And um, there's also a focus on things that I think are quite important, like active travel and public transport, to not just within individual towns like here in Letchworth, but actually um, connecting to other towns as well. So we're not in isolation. We're not alone. It's, it's, we're, you know, it's, it's a family of towns. Um, and I think it's vital that policymakers and people in positions of power, they're looking at the impact of the policies that they're creating on different groups within the community. So women, um, there has been touched on by Emily, um, but I'm thinking here specifically the BAME communities. Um, and I also want to talk about the community and voluntary sector because I'm, I'm the vice chair of a local centre for voluntary service. And I think that these community and voluntary sector groups, they're vital to the recovery as they have been throughout this pandemic and actually taking on the public service gap that's left by the lack of local government funding. Um, and they're on the ground day in, day out, absolutely vital to commun community cohesion because that's where most people experience these things um, in the first instance. Um, so I, I want to close on this idea of hearing local voices. It's, it's our community that makes up um, a place. And I think that as cooperators, we want to see that towns are confident, optimistic and open. Um, so, yeah, I'm really grateful for the work that's been done by Hope Not Hate on this um, and look forward to working with you in the future and also hope that everyone standing for election um, as Labour and Co-op is successful because we need we need that representation and at this time it's it couldn't be more vital. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, Tina, and for sharing your, your experiences, but also um, how it relates to the, the forthcoming elections. Can I just ask, where is it behind you on your screen? I'm intrigued as to the, the building behind you. Is that Letchworth? Yes, it's um, it. So it used to be our town hall. It's now being reused for other um, purposes. Yeah. Thank you. I was curious. Um, so we, we, we've got a few um, minutes to take. Um, some questions um, and um, I will rattle through these um, and ask um, both Chris, Emily and Tina to, to come in um, if that's all right. Um, th there's a, a question that's come in and I think this is quite interesting. I'm based up here in, in Rotherham uh, so can relate to this question. Obviously you've focused on towns but um, what about former mining villages um, for example? Are there any sort of uh, similarities or anything that can be taken from that um, as well. Uh, I'll do these questions in, in threes because I know we've only got sort of a, a few 15 minutes left. So um, I will um, go through all of them and then we can respond to them. And the second one's from Deborah. Um, she lives in Newark on Trent and unfortunately Robert Jenrick is her MP. Um, she wants to ask the panel their thoughts regarding to having to bid for the funding to improve town centres and the way the towns have been selected um, and you know what do you think around this drip feeding of funds to town centres in the future and I know it's been a big issue with the budget um, in, in the last week. Um, okay and and I think um, there's a really nice message from John um, to Tina, who was the youngest member of Hearts County Council in 1973, and he wants to wish you a lot of um, a, a lot um, um, of good wishes um, with the, that. Um, but he's also commented on a, sort of the high rate of um, sort of clusters of COVID fatalities um, that I think you mentioned. And I think actually that's quite an interesting question. Obviously, Chris, your your research was done before COVID, but actually, does any of the information um, uh, and the links maybe between um, deprivation and the high rates of COVID, is there anything we can sort of take from that um, going further? Uh, and then the final question, and 
it's probably more to the politicians, but asking about um, a radical taxation and transfer policy, um, is that is that needed now? So, um, sort of four four kind of questions there. One about the mining villages, uh, one about the the towns funding, um, I, one about the the COVID any uh, and clusters and high instances in our communities, and then about taxation and, and transfer policy. Um, would anybody like to go first with that? Should we, should we go in reverse? Tina, you don't have to answer all of them, but anything you'd like to, to comment on? Yes, please. Um, the In particular, the, I think, the town centre funding, and this has been really controversial. So Robert Jenrick, um, that when this was raised in at the end of last year, um, it was very much so a scandal. Um, I think that I think that it's quite clear to us um, that actually the towns that are receiving funding it doesn't appear impartial um, in any way, and I think that's really concerning. Mm -hmm. I also have a real concern about this idea of pitting towns against one another um, rather than focusing on sharing best practice and ideas and principles. Um, so that's that's quite concerning. Um, and I, I agree that the clusters of COVID-19 deaths are particularly worrying. Um, I've been part of um, a volunteering effort to distribute the correct information about COVID-19 in terms of prevention and the vaccine um, and the kind of feedback I'm getting from certain communities on that is there's a real lack of trust um, where local government is concerned and kind of trust where public authorities more broadly um, are concerned but I think that we can all champion um, our values and the correct information in our communities and actually seeing that from somebody you know and distributing that's really important um, it's concerned me on social media actually because misinformation and I think this goes hand in hand with um, the far right because um, whatever we're doing to tackle certain messaging um, unfortunately they always seem to come out stronger and it's it's briefer messages and that kind of snappy headlines that draw people in um so it's really important we do what we can to um address deprivation concerns um address community cohesion and distribute the correct information but in the correct way thank you very much um some interesting comments there and and um there's some comments um coming in um councillor tim swift leader of calderdale council has joined us obviously um very interested in the analysis um and sort of ha halifax in particular is mentioned there um but also um highlighting the issue around bidding issue around that capital versus revenue um, split that we can get infrastructure but um, maybe not the revenue to to fix things up but I think uh, for any councillor that 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 rings true and he says bidding for the town's fund has been a nightmare. Emily is any of those questions you want to, to pick up on? Uh, I would just echo his comments I think that's absolutely right um, I I um, you know I, I think it's very obvious that government is is completely political in this. Um, I'm absolutely sure that the only reason we were able to build for the Towns Fund, that while we're a Labour and co-op led uh, council, we have two Tory MPs, and I'm sure that's why we're on the list. I'm sure, you know, we really do need it. Bletchley really does need that uh, revitalization. Uh, I have to say the MP was not the least bit interested in attending any of the board meetings or anything like that, but was of course the first one to announce how he delivered all of this money. So, you know, it's completely political, uh, but um, we are in a position and the councils and the cuts in our funding, which means we do have to take these opportunities. 
the other one, which is the act of travel, which Tina mentioned, you know, they're upset that people are upset. Well, they did they're at the timeline that they gave us to introduce cycling schemes uh, was so short. And then they go, oh, but it's the council's fault that they didn't do all this consultation. You didn't actually give us a chance to do consultation in the middle of a pandemic. You said we had to spend this money uh, by then. And actually, if we're gonna have real discussions about modal shift, that is actually about changing behaviors. It's not just about building a cycle lane. Um, and, and, you know, the capital and revenue thing is absolutely relevant. Uh, I did want to pick up this radical taxation policy and, and, and well, it won't be, Emma won't be surprised to hear me <laughs> say that. I think um, it's, we need to have a fundamental rethink. And, and so without, without trying to make it too broad, let's just focus on high streets. If we're serious about high streets and revitalizing our high streets, we need to be really clear about what we're taxing. Uh, because it is completely unfair that Amazon gets away with, spent with the business rates that they do, while the high streets, the independent high street shops are having to pay what they're having to pay now. We've had this bit of a break in business rates and all that, and, and, and obviously it's not just about those issues, uh, but it's also about the fact that the council does not get that business rate money back in totality to invest back into that local economy. Um, so, well, anyways, we'll see what the fundamental review talks about, but we do need to absolutely think about radically taxing things differently, because if we look at who owns the land on our high streets, that is one of the biggest barriers for us proceeding with, with changing our high streets into, into places that are cultural experiences that are community experiences um, you know we're dealing with very few land landowners actually on our high streets and and so we do need to have a fundamental rethink about the value of that space and how that's used in our communities and who has the power to to affect that um, and that's where uh, the cooperative movement and the cooperative party you know, can, can, you know, it's that working together that, that may give us the power to stand up to some of those vested interests. No, thank you very much. And, and just coming in, <laughs> I like this comment, brilliant, Emily, well said. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, and just leaves me with you, um, Chris, any sort of reflections on that? Anything you want to sort of finish on? Um, but also maybe picking that up that that issue around mining villages I thought was quite interesting. Um, yeah really really interesting questions actually. Um, the first question on mining villages is an interesting one. Obviously the report was limited in the respect that we wanted to focus on towns so we um, we had a kind of bottom cutoff point in terms of place size at one end, if you like, in a top cutoff point in terms of place size at the other, just because I think it gets, if you don't have those cutoff points, if you, you end up comparing a kind of mining village with 3000 people with a place like Sheffield or something, it's just quite, you're not necessarily always comparing like with like, but absolutely, I think with mining villages, um, likely to have a lot of the, the challenges that we raise, um, particularly the challenges around um, shrinking and aging populations uh, and the kind of some of the questions around um, the, the traditional demographics as well older predominantly white populations with less experience of diversity often um, and there's uh, so I think those certainly there's probably a really interesting piece of analysis to be done about some of these smaller places um, it was interesting we generally found when we looked at it that villages were more um, liberal than towns they were less liberal than big cities but more liberal than towns which i thought was an interesting factor actually it, it wasn't just that the poorer the, the smaller places the more kind of hostile it is to to change or difference it was it was that towns were particularly i think likely to have had economic decline in some of those challenges whereas villages often they were historically kind of smaller places to start with and there was less of a an issue going on but within the kind of village bracket you have a, a whole a, a whole set of villages in in uh, in Yorkshire and the, the the dales and the um south, south the Welsh valleys and in the northeast that are have quite a different type of 
experience to um, to other sorts of uh, village. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting point, uh, that one. On the question of the town's fund and drip feeding, um, yeah, everyone sort of said quite a lot on that already, and I sort of ag agree with a lot of that. Um, it's a really hard question uh, because I think there has been some good provisions provided by the government, but by the same token, the way of doing it, of having people apply and compete with each other, firstly creates quite a lot of extra bureaucracy and um, uh, secondly, and, and time, it takes a lot of time. And secondly, means that it's not necessarily allocated and need sometimes, but on how good the applications are. So it's already, there's a sort of inequality in how good applications can be and things like that. Um, so I'd say it's probably positive things like the town's fund, or it is positive things like the town fund, but in the longer term sense, much more is needed, I think, to really get to some of the systemic issues we're looking at in this report. Um, the questions around COVID fatalities, very interesting question, and I think we tried to look at it within the report, but a lot of the research we did in the report was basically in the spring during that first lockdown where we were trying to keep up with the data as it was happening. Um, but certainly it's going to amplify, our, we, we wrote a blog on this a little while actually, ago actually, but on there being a, potentially a whole new raft of towns facing economic challenges, places which were, say, tourist towns or places which were towns based around servicing of an airport, which had tradition, which within our analysis were not on the real sharp end of this stuff, will be particularly hit quite hard, I think, by, by COVID. And it will be the, the big risk with this is that whole set of towns which aren't currently in that kind of risk, risk categories in terms of cohesion um, start to face these challenges. Uh, and yeah, the radical taxation and transfer, um, very, I'm not sure what the answer is about that. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a hard one. Um, certainly we think the ideas behind the leveling up agenda, the question will be ultimately whether places actually catch up and whether the gap between more affluent and poorer places closes or whether it's kind of really just saying it can everywhere grow and it doesn't have that leveling element. Um, one one small point yeah just to sorry i know i'm out of time but just to put the i'm just putting thank you very much emma for putting the link to the event next week in the um in the webinar and i'm just going to plunk it in again uh just because at that event we're we've got chris you've gone on to mute hang on <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> got some point. Go on, go for it. <laughs> I, put, I put that in the group, and there's a couple of there's a couple of speakers there who've got some quite interesting ideas about how you can unlock the the potential of high streets and and um, you know take a risk on uh, using sp empty spaces and things like that. So uh, yeah, please do come along if you can make it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's my answer to those four questions. Thank, thanks a lot again for everyone for having us. No, um, it just goes for me to say um, thank you very much, Chris, um, for sharing. The insight into that report and a huge thank you to Emily and Tina for sharing their experiences but also um, to everybody who's joined the call and shared their thoughts as well. I think it's been really really interesting. Uh, a lot of food for thought at a lunchtime. I'll certainly go away and have a think um, this afternoon. Um, lots of issues you know we just narrowed in on the particularly around the high streets um, but that report covers a lot of the challenges faces faced by towns and I think we could um, discuss this for a good few hours yet. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for joining us um, this lunchtime and we'll leave you to your afternoon. Thank you.